Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Captain Tim Gunther. I'm one of the general surgery residents at the integrated uh, uh, general surgery residency at Travis Air Force Base associated with UC Davis. Um, I have uh, no disclosures except for the fact that uh, I don't speak French, and so if I mispronounce any French names or terms, uh, I apologize. Uh, first, I'm going to look at a case that piqued my interest in this topic. Uh, due to time constraints, I'm only going to discuss one of the cases. Then I'll transition into some background information in regards to Daguerre and Gatz hernias, discuss the aims of our studies, the methods, uh, and uh, um, results and discussions related to our project. A 66-year-old man presented to our local VA in Sacramento with a two-day history of a right growing pain and bulge. He was not able to reduce the bulge, uh, and he had uh, no signs of obstruction besides some intermittent nausea. Uh, he denied any vomiting or constitutional symptoms. His surgical hi uh, history was only remarkable for a uh, bilateral open inguinal hernia repair. His right was repaired 30 years uh, prior, and the left repaired six years prior, and the patient was unsure if uh, mesh, mesh was used in either repair. On exam, he appeared non-toxic. His vitals were within normal limits. His abdominal exam was unremarkable. An exam of the right growing showed a three centimeter bulge just below the inguinal ligament that was tender to palpation without any associated uh, overlying uh, skin changes. And a picture of his uh, growing is shown here. Given the prior right uh, inguinal hernia repair, a CT scan was obtained, which showed a likely right femoral hernia containing fat and likely containing a, a segment of small bowel versus the appendix. So the patient was taken back to the operating room and a right growing incision was made. No prior mesh was encountered. No indirect or uh, direct inguinal hernias were noted and the bulge was confirmed to be a femoral hernia. The inguinal ligament was, is uh, pointed out here as well as a surgical instrument uh, is shown passed through the femoral space. The femoral hernia was passed cephalad to the inguinal ligament and opened. Uh, to our surprise, we identified an isolated erythematous and congested appendix. Uh, the decision was made to perform an appendectomy through the groin uh, once the base of the cecum was able to be drawn into the femoral hernia. And the femoral uh, defect was repaired using an open McVeigh repair uh, without mesh. Uh, the patient did well and was discharged on postoperative day one. So a day Garingat's hernia is a femoral hernia that contains the appendix. Uh, this is in contrast to an amion's hernia, which is uh, through which uh, a, uh, uh, an inguinal uh, hernia uh, through which the, the appendix passes. It was first described by the French surgeon René de Guéringat in uh, 1731. Multiple case reports have been published, yet the last large review of the literature took place in 1925. And there exists a classification system for amion's hernias, but not uh, de Guéringat's hernias. So the aims of our study were to, uh, twofold. First, to review the published literature for cases of Dave Garingat's hernia since 1925, and second, to create a classification systems uh, for uh, Dave Garingat's hernias. Uh, to identify cases, we used uh, the three search engines listed here with the following search phrases. To be included for analysis, the case report or case description needed to contain the following. A case where the appendix, uh, or where, where, the, where a femoral hernia was present and contained the appendix, basic demographic information about the patient, presenting symptoms and our physical exam findings, and a gross description of the appearance of the, ap uh, appearance of the appendix and related structures within the femoral hernia. It was also necessary for the case to be in English. Listed here is the classification system we developed to help characterize the uh, de Garingat's hernias. Uh, the classification system is based on the gross appearance of the appendix and related structures. Stage one corresponds to a normal appearing appendix. Stage two uh, corresponds to an erythematous, inflamed, and congested appearing appendix uh, with or without involvement of another segment of intestine. Stage three corresponds to necrosis of the appendix, either isolated to the tip or involving the whole appendix. Stage four corresponds to necrosis uh, plus an additional segment of intestine. And stage five corresponds to a perforated appendix with or without abscess or fistula. So we identified 177 cases of day garing hernia hernia in, in uh, 155 uh, published reports. Cases were more commonly published in Europe, but cases were seen worldwide. The average age of patient at presentation was 69, and near 80% of patients were female. Shown here is the age, uh, gender distribution of patients. A bulge over the groin was observed in nearly 80 to 85% of patients, and abdominal pain was present in only 25%. On physical exam, a bulge was present 95% of the time, and tenderness over that bulge uh, was seen 85% of the time. 
Uh, lastly, erythema was seen in 33% uh, of cases uh, overlying the right groin, or overlying the groin. An isolated inguinal incision was the most common route of repair, occurring in about 50% of cases, but cases were repaired through a midline laparotomy, McBurney's incision, and laparoscopically. An appendectomy was performed in 98% uh, of cases, and a malignancy was noted in 2.8% of cases, and a complication rate of 11.3% was observed, with a surgical site infection being the most common. About 30% of men and 9% of women reported a previous right-sided inguinal hernia repair. A preoperative diagnosis was made in 24% of cases. And uh, interestingly, if the diagnosis was made uh, preoperatively, it was associated with a lower complication rate and a shorter mean length of stay. Shown here is the distribution of cases based on our classification system. The most common was a uh, stage 2A, corresponding to an erythematous uh, 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 inflamed or congested appearing appendix, which was present in 42% of cases. Uh, the second most common was a stage five, which corresponded to a perforated appendix with or without abscess. And then lastly of note, 7.3% uh, of cases were associated with a normal appearing appendix, uh, which corresponded to stage one. So overall, we found these hernias to be quite rare, with only 177 cases published. Uh, within about the last century. Nearly 80% were found in females, which is similar to the overall distribution of femoral hernias. There appeared to be some benefit if the diagnosis was known preoperatively, as the complication rate and uh, hospital length of stay was shorter. Um, however, this must be weighed against the fact that uh, imaging can delay a trip to the operating room in somebody with a, a suspected incarcerated or strangulated femoral hernia. Many authors have proposed mechanisms for why Degarengat's hernias occur but they all, have to, all of them have to do with the appendix being in close proximity to the femoral space. Microtrauma to the appendix can lead to inflammation or adhesions between the appendix and potential hernia sac. And, last, and lastly, the, the tight nature of the femoral canal um, can prevent spread to the peritoneal cavity if uh, inflammation, necrosis, or perforation is present, which was echoed by our results, which showed that only 24% of patients had abdominal pain. So our classification system is the uh, first to characterize the diversity of how these hernias can present clinically. We hope to use this classification system um, to gain a better understanding of these the uh, gain a better understanding of these hernias and potentially aid in the treatment strategies. We understand no two cases of Dave Garengat's hernias are the same, um, but uh, just to offer some some. Uh, uh, points or, or uh, uh, highlights in regards to uh, the, the care of these hernias. First, there appears to be some benefit if imaging is obtained preoperatively, but uh, we understand that this should not delay a trip to the operating room. Next, um, as long as erythema over the growing is not present, uh, we uh, recommend uh, considering a repair laparoscopically first. If erythema was present over the growing, there was a 44% chance of the case being a stage five, which corresponded to a perforated appendix with or without abscess or fistula. Uh, the laparoscopic approach can potentially allow visualization of other contents of the abdominal cavity and allow preperitoneal placement of mesh, but this uh, method uh, will not assess a potentially more superficial abscess that might need to be uh, drained uh, in the growing. Third, we recommend appendectomy for any case not associated with stage three. If uh, a Degarengat's hernia is present, the patient's anatomy is such that the appendix is in close proximity to the femoral canal. So even if, a, uh, so if, uh, even if the femoral hernia is repaired, there still exists a potential for adhesion formation near the appendix that could potentially lead to either intraperitoneal appendicitis or recurrent Degarengat's or uh, Namion's hernia in the future. And then lastly, if uh, open approach is chosen, most cases can be repaired through the groin without the need for uh, to enter into the abdominal cavity. So in summary, Degar and Gatz hernias represent a rare and clinically heterogeneous type of hernia, and acute care surgeons should be aware of the interesting set of diagnostic management uh, challenge this condition presents. So here are some other members of our team, and I'd like to thank you guys uh, for your time. <laughs>